Thank you, Pastor, for that. Amen. Amen. Tonight's lesson is called Freedom for the Future. Um, our devotional reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. And our background scripture and our printed passage both come from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 30. Uh, would anybody like to read Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 30? stated the Sunday school lesson is called freedom for the future if you look at verse 18 it says 
Um, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Um, and you know, like I know, Paul speaks on suffering a lot. And Paul is speaking in regard to their suffering. And to be exact, he speaks to the present suffering that we are experiencing. And he makes it plain and clear that there is no comparison to the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul truly was saying, I know that we are going through some things now. And they still don't outweigh what is waiting for us. And y'all know this verse, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 through 18. Anybody want to read that? Should have it memorized, actually, by now, as much as we say it. <laughs> what was that? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. And read 18, well, too. For <laughs> our light of fiction, which is but for a moment, working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Yeah. And, and we, we see verse 17, and you know we've been hitting that a lot. But now we get to talk about the deliverance. And you remember we uh, that sermon I was doing a few weeks back ago about why not me? Well, verse 18 tells you why not me. So we fix our eyes on what's happening to us. We see that. We know we're going to go through something. But stop worrying about that. Because it says, but look at what is unseen. You already know in verse 17 that you're going to have these troubles and they're going to be light for the moment. But as you go through your suffering, do you look to your deliverance? Because the Lord always delivers. He's always there with you. But we concentrate on what we can see. Since what is seen is temporary, we know these things are going to happen for a while. We already know that. But what is unseen is eternal. And it speaks to the rewarding here. So the, the weight of the trials and the problems that you go through do not outweigh the glory that you will receive. We must realize that all suffering is momentarily. But glory is eternal. And the question that we should ask and I think Paul was bringing it out as, why are your eyes focused on this suffering? You know there's going to be some suffering here. This body is built for it. Christ went to the cross. We know. So why are we focused on that? Remember that Paul himself had suffered more than any except the Lord. And he is cheering and talking about making it through suffering. He said, don't even worry about it. The fact that the glory will be revealed to us and in us, the glory is in us right now. And if you believe, though, you got to believe for it to be in you. And when we get to heaven, it will be revealed. Totally. It says that the glory will be revealed, which means it is already here. It's already here. Holy Spirit is here. He can walk you through it. And, and we're going to see some things here. But in verse 19, it says, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. In short, we are God's creation and waiting eagerly for the revelation. We ain't trying to enhance it. We ain't trying to make it happen because we can't. But we are waiting for it. And we wait for this anxious because... Our sins condemned us to the life of suffering. We messed up, but the salvation and redemption will be at hand, and then we will no longer suffer. So in short, creation is waiting on the Lord. We all know there is a judgment day. We waiting for it. 
Some may be afraid of it. Some may not want it, but it's coming. So even if you don't believe, guess what? You still waiting on it. So it says in verse 20, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of one who subjected it in hope. And I, I was reading this and I went back to the King James Version because I liked how it said it. It said, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, okay. but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. Now, when I went back to it in the King James Version, I saw a few other things. And if you look at it, these commas in this statement separate three separate things. The thing that got us into the trouble with the Lord was our own vanity. It, it says, for the creature was made subject to vanity. We engaged in it. When we try to be more, when we try to think away from God's will, when we try to do things that we should not do. Adam and Eve did it in a garden. You can think about when Nimrod told him he was going to reach the heavens and make a seat and give him a sword and everything else that went along with that. We had our own vanity going on. And this causes trouble. And it happened in the beginning. And it continues to happen. We separated from the Lord through sin. Then you go to the next part of the verse and it says, not willingly. And this is, this is a funny part because this was not willingly. We were and are guilty of the act of sin. But the punishment... That was not a part of man's will. The man didn't want that punishment. It was the will of the one that handed out the punishment. So it was the will of God. We did wrong. You know we didn't want any punishment from God. You can see when Adam and Eve were hiding in the garden. They did not want a punishment, but... It was handed out. And then when it says, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. Uh-oh. It simply tells you that you had the authority to subject the same in hope, and that is the Lord. He has the authority. This is all God's will. God has and had the authority to destroy us based on our vanity, our actions, our sins, going against them, being disobedient, whatever you may want to call it. But God also has the restoring ability and he is subject us to hope. And the work of hope is not a man thing, it's a God thing. The Lord could only do it. Man could not do it. The Lord had a plan for us the whole time. But man couldn't do it. We couldn't sacrifice. We couldn't praise. We couldn't do nothing. But the Lord had a plan. So, in 21, it says that the creation of itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of death. If you just read it simply, it just says that we were liberated from being a slave to sin and dying or condemnation and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God, which means we had a savior because that's how we became co-heirs of the kingdom. And this hope benefits the believers, but it truly benefits all creation. This is God's hope for all men and the fallen men. You do have a chance to turn to the Lord. So it is a, he is available to everyone. Question is, do you go to him? Um, anybody want to read 2 Peter 1st chapter verse 4? Peter 
2 Peter, 1st chapter, uh, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through love. See, and, and you know the other week I was telling y'all we could read some of these verses backwards and, and see a lot more sometimes. Since you escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, now you can be partakers in the divine nature. And it was a promise. It was a great and precious promise. And this corruption here ascribed to the creation, us as well as God's hope of its redemption, meaning redeeming us, and of it becoming partakers of the liberty of the glory of the children of God are statements that simply cannot speak to any other being except man. This is not for the animals. This is for man. Animals aren't in bondage to slavery or to sin. They may have received some of the consequences of sin, such as death and all of that, but they are not in bondage to sin. This is about man. And he's telling them here. And then we go to 22 and it says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So we understand that all creation has been going through some pain, even to this day in regard to their suffering. If death is upon you, then you have been groaning. And we all know what comes with death, and I don't care if your life is perfect, your body even changes. You get aches, you get ailments, you get sick, you get sore, you get slower, you get bigger, smaller, whatever it may be, but you can tell that there is something going on and the pains that are going with it. But that's just the flesh. If death is upon you, then you have been groaning. The pains from physical to emotional, then you have been groaning just like if you were going through childbirth. And this groaning is a sorrow of suffering. And although Paul speaks up to the time that he is addressing, and he's talking to them right then and there, it is still true today. We shall suffer. There are birth pains because you are going to God and this is what happens in your suffering. You know, you don't, you don't suffer because you like the world. You suffer because you're trying to be like God. You fall into troubles when you go away from God. But this world is already fighting us. So when you're going through these sufferings, be patient and look for the, his deliverance more than you look for the suffering. And that's what Paul was saying a, a little bit ago. Stop looking at what's in front of you and start looking at what is already prepared for you. We get stuck into too much of, I'm going through something, this is this, this is that. But we really never say, God, thank you. Because even in our suffering, when we are weak, he is strong. We have the ability to call on him. But when we call on him, we just call on him and say, get me out of this situation and saying, instead of saying, Lord, thank you for delivering me from this situation. It's always a suffering. So in verse 23, he says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So when you say first fruit, you think of the glory because the first fruit was Christ. And we partake or taste the first fruits of the glory that is coming. And remember that it far outweighs anything here that has to do with suffering. And as we are waiting, we are waiting for our new bodies. There goes part of your childbirth, that adoption to sonship, the redemption part of your body. We are waiting for our new bodies. And 
this passage is long, but I want you to read what it says about your new body. Anybody want to um, read Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter five, verses one through eight? Well, we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an, inter an eternal body made for us by God Himself and not by human hands. We grow re weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly body like new clothing. Ooh. But we will put on, for we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it is not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. Ooh. God, God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord, for we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. See, we have a new body coming, and the fact of all of this is that a human hand, a man, has nothing to do with it. But it is all God's work. Life and suffering will swallow up these bodies. And these bodies were made to suffer. But look at the benefits of the new body in the next two verses that we're going to read. First, um, Revelation 21 and 4. Anybody want to read that? And God shall wipe away all their tears. Go ahead. Go ahead, I'm And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for, for the former things are passed away. Now, when, when we read this verse, for the former things are passed away. Well, one of those former things are and is your earthly body. And with that earthly body being passed away, the earthly restrictions to that body, the earthly aggressions towards that body, the aging and all those things, the sorrow, the crying, none of that will be there because you no longer in that body. That body is gone. So this speaks to no more earthly pains in your new body first and foremost. But then if you go to 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 54, he's going to tell you the changes that you're going to see or you'll know about. Anybody want to read that? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorrupt, incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on in, incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass. The saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Uh-oh. So even with this change in your new body, it tells you right here, death gets swallowed up because it can't do nothing against you anymore. And it says death is swallowed up in victory. All of this is gone. And this is all God. This is not man. This is all God's doing. God predestined this. God knew this from the beginning. Because he wanted us to be with him. 
and he tells you the things of this world cannot be in his world. He says, for the, for the corruptible, that's not good. You got to be incorruptible. The mortal body has to be an immortal body to be in eternity. And then he tells you in 54 how they all have to change. So that's going to be dumb. Corruption is gone. And you will be put in an incorrupt body. And this mortal body shall put on an immortal body. So you can be with the Lord. And death has nothing to say about it. Because death is now lost. So in verse 24 it says. For in this hope we were saved. But hope is seen. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Ooh. And I try to condense this. In our hope we are saved. We know that the Lord will give us all that we need to deal with in this world and life because he has given us salvation, grace, and mercy. And that there will be a resurrection for us. And a death will have and death will have no sting, as we just read. But if you look back at Jeremiah 29 and 11, the Lord said, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The Lord already has a plan for us in the end. This was planned out. And who planned it out? No man has. Even in our transgressions, iniquities, sins against the Lord, he still has provided for us. The hope that is seen is no hope. Uh oh, because there's no need for you to hope for what you see. I hope I get a new car. Well, it's in front of you, so I ain't hoping for it anymore. I got it. But if you if you look at the verse 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, it says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three things. But the greatest of these is charity, which is love. Well, if you even read that verse, the reason that love is the greatest is because faith will be rewarded. And the hope that they have will now be seen. So there will be no need for hope again once the Lord comes. There will be no need for faith because he will be here. But that love part will always be. Love is eternal in this situation. This hope is the expectation of future, I say good slash reward. That's what we expect. We are hoping for Christ to come back. We are hoping that he has his will done. But when he gets here, we won't be hoping. He will be here. And the hope that is seen, that is enjoyed, is no longer hope. You can see it. A man cannot hope for that which he has in his possession. How can you hope for heaven when you think you got heaven in your possession? We can't. We are waiting to be changed, to go. And then in verse 25 it says, But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And we wait for it patiently knowing that the Lord has this all in hand. Yeah, it may seem slow to you, but some of us better be glad the Lord is long suffering. We are and have been adopted as co-heirs to the kingdom. But we wait patiently to the full adoption because we haven't got to the full adoption of co-heirs to the kingdom yet. 
we will have to be patiently waiting and getting ready and that means that we will have to endure through and persevere through some things anybody want to read um, Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 and 7 In short, don't be anxious, but keep hope alive, waiting for that glorious day. We all are waiting for that glorious day. We all want to be in glory with the Lord. We all want to be out of this physical body that we are in that takes us through this and that, where we are suffering, but be patient. Don't be anxious. And verse 26 says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And the Spirit has a job. And one of them is to help us in our weaknesses. Question is, do we call on them? If you don't know what to pray for, then the Spirit will speak for you through wordless groans, as it says. The Holy Spirit does the intercessory work for us also. We know that Jesus does it, but now you get to hear the Holy Spirit does it. Anybody want to read um, 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15? in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Uh-oh. For if I pray in a tongue, that's your spirit praying. And it says, but but your mind is unfruitful. Your mind doesn't know what your spirit is saying. That's what the unfruitful part is. So what should you do? Pray with your spirit. That's what you do. And then I will also pray with my understanding. And then it tells you that you will sing with my spirit, but I will I will always I will also sing with my understanding. See the here's another job of the spirit. You know, even when you and, and people don't really pay attention to this, but sometimes you can be speaking a word to somebody or teaching somebody or just walk up on somebody and talk about God and you don't know how you knew what you said. It may be in you but you didn't know it was in you like that and the spirit brings it out. The spirit intercedes for us at many times and we have to remember that. The spirit has a job and we'll do another job he has in a moment. And then 27 says, and he who searches our heart knows the mind of the spirit. Uh oh. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Holy Spirit searches the heart. Because that is who at work, that is who is at work to intercede to the Father for us. So now you know the Holy Spirit also searches your heart. As I say, another one of his jobs. The thing that you have to realize though is the Spirit only works in those that have the Spirit. And this is all in accordance with the will of God. If you don't believe, he ain't roaming in you. He waiting for you to believe, but he ain't roaming in you. You got to confess. You got to believe. 
So in verse 28 it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And this in short is truly saying that God is in control. God is always in control. God handles every part of our lives, and yes, that does include suffering, but if you look at suffering, then it works to make you more dependent on the Lord, and that increases your relationship, and then he delivers you, which increases your faith. You remember we had some fruits from suffering. So all of this, God is in control. And then it speaks to, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. The author of salvation is God. Period. Exclamation point. If you look at the wording of foreknew and predestined, you knew that the Lord always, not maybe, not thought about it right then, but he always had a plan. The part that we play, we must participate in this eternal plan of the Lord's. It's not an option. Whether you choose to believe or not believe, you will participate in the plan. But this allows us to be adopted and partake in his family. And that is why we are in the image of Jesus Christ. You gonna look like his family, you gonna do like his family. So in verse 30 it says, And those he predestined, he also called, those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. In short, God has done all the work, and those that have been predestined, God called, and if he called them, he justified them. And then if he did that, he glorified them. God continues to do all of the work. But that is how we even get our freedom for the future. That is how we have been freed from sin. That is how we have received grace and mercy. That is how we have seen Christ on the cross. That's how we can repent. That is how we can go to the Father without having to go through everybody else. That is why Christ is our mediator. It's all the work of the Lord. And if we want that freedom for the future, then we have to understand that this is God's work. And although he gives us will, freedom, we should be doing God's work. We want to be there in the future. We are hoping for the Lord to come back and take us to glory. We are hoping that the Lord takes care of everything that he's promised us. So we want to be in this picture because he has freed us from everything. And where else would you want to go? Amen. That's it. Questions, comments, anything. If God already had all this plan for us, yeah. I know I know it's a process. We have to go through the process. As he did with with, with Adam and Eve. And he had the uh Michael said backup plan, but Jesus was already the promised plan. And for us to get from uh earth to glory. We had to go through all the process. 
and we can bet. God has never said that nowhere. You won't find it nowhere in Scripture. But many, many have, 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 have left this walk because of the, of the strain, the struggle. They can't deal with the long suffering. And that people say that God is putting too much on, on them. Either he's already created you to handle it. But you yourself are going to pick it up. You still don't want to go in and be a split. He's looking at that verse for all he did for no. He also did a predestined to the to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn. Now you know what you made out of. You're so you know what you made out of. I like, you know, man, you talk about this thing about uh, so many people are committing suicide because they can't have the light. Where do this fit in for them? You said, where does it fit in for uh, them? Yeah. Well, I'm going I'm to just hopefully answer this correctly for you. <laughs> because of the struggle and the strain that they go through. I say they're not made like me and you. They're not made like me and you. Maybe they ain't calling on them enough, but it tells you to keep hope, right? And, and, and who did he come for? Who did who did Jesus come for? For the laws. For the laws. And, and he took care of sins for who? All mankind. So, he done already gave you the call to him. He done called on everybody. Now, the question is, is everybody going to listen to the call? Some people are not. As I said, some people are not. 